Good afternoon and welcome to the Nantucket Land Council's fourth annual State of the Harbor Forum. I'm Emily Molden, Executive Director of the Nantucket Land Council, and I would like to thank the sponsors of today's event, the Nantucket Shellfish Association and Anderson Stillwater Moorings. I would also like to acknowledge the generous support of our membership and direct supporters of the Land Council's Water Fund that have made this year's virtual event possible. The NLC looks forward to presenting this public educational experience each year to provide a more in-depth look at different aspects of the health of our harbor resources. As always, there is a lot going on that we are excited to share. As a primary player, if not the primary player, in local policies, research, and management, we welcome the town, in addition to other island partners, including the Nantucket Conservation Foundation, to share the latest and to join us in updating the community on the state of the harbor. As those of us represented here today, along with many others, have prioritized a healthy harbor and have increased the resources that we're focusing on research and management, there's a greater need for connection and collaboration around our shared goals so that we can all be as efficient and effective as possible moving forward. To that end, I'm very excited to be working with the town to form a collaborative group of island organizations to better support and coordinate the multitude of research and planning efforts that are underway around our marine resources. I'm also very excited to announce a brand new partnership that will surely strengthen the Land Council's ability to support these efforts. The Nantucket Land Council has become an official partner of the Waterkeeper Alliance. The Waterkeeper Alliance is a global network of organizations that all share a common goal, fishable, swimmable, and drinkable water for all communities. So we will be administering the island's first waterkeeper program as the Nantucket Waterkeeper. This will connect us to a wide range of resources and expertise to support our water protection efforts on and around Nantucket. I think it's fair to say that over the last several years, there has been a buzz around the island about climate change. Certainly, many of its elements have been intertwined with our island discussions and our planning efforts for some time. But in recent years, the conversation has become clearer and has certainly been amplified. This evening's program will focus on the impacts and implications of a change in climate as they relate specifically to Nantucket Harbor, but also to our community. As Nantucket moves forward to address the impending implications of climate change and sea level rise, it's really important to foster greater awareness and conversation around the interconnectedness of our built environment and the sea. The interface of these two zones is becoming increasingly relevant and increasingly gray as is evidenced by many articles in today's newspaper that document increased flooding events that we experienced just this week, as well as erosion events around the island. As this transition continues to take place, we have an opportunity to transition with it. There are many communities who have already faced difficult decisions and Nantucket is poised to learn from them and also to explore our own options in negotiating the changes that are upon us and to do so in a way that continues to protect and preserve our natural resources. What exactly are we doing on Nantucket from a research and a planning perspective that will inform our management decisions in the face of our changing climate? And how can this work help us to build greater sustainability and resiliency in our harbor environment and also on our shores? Our first series of presentations will be addressing these questions. We'll be hearing from four local experts who will describe some of the ongoing efforts to understand how our harbor ecosystem is changing, as well as some of the efforts that are currently underway to address these changes and to help us plan and prepare for the future. I will be back afterward to introduce our keynote speaker to you, who will then take us on the journey of perspectives from different communities to help us think a little bit more creatively about our own collective response to climate change. We are going to hear from all of our presenters first and there will be an opportunity to ask questions following our final presentation. So without further ado, let's begin. Good 
Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Carlson, the Director of Natural Resources for the Town of Nantucket Natural Resources Department. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today how Nantucket's Natural Resources Department is implementing our data strategies and our research strategies into improving the Town of Nantucket's Coastal Resiliency Program. First and foremost, the vision of the Natural Resources Department is to preserve, protect, or restore Nantucket's natural resources through responsible active management, research, education, and outreach. These core principles are what we try to incorporate into our planning, our discussions, and our communications back to the public about what's going on in and around our harbors and the lands and watersheds that we're protecting. To integrate coastal resiliency into this framework is something that's new to our department. When the department formed in 2011, coastal resiliency wasn't something we were talking about at the time. We were busy focusing on restoring our, our watersheds, working on our water quality, bringing shellfish populations back, and terms like sea level rise and climate change were just things that were being talked about in the background and not something that was driven to the forefront. I'll be talking a little bit about today about all of these programs and how we're integrating them into coastal resiliency. So first and foremost, we're gonna talk about the bottom of the totem pole, water quality. This is the support for everything that we do, from managing habitats to looking at how we're managing our inputs in the water, this is what's important. We do lots of great activities on the water, including our total maximum daily load or TMDL compliance monitoring. And what we've added in in the last couple years is a program that's really great our SOND program, and these SONDs are deployed throughout the harbor or Pulpus Harbor at two week intervals. And in every two weeks, we recollect them and get data that's taken every 15 minutes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we can really see in real time what's happening with our dissolved oxygen, with our pH, with our chlorophyll, so what's happening with the algae in the water, and really get a sense of what's happening. And we can see how all of these day-to-day -day changes and fluctuations really affect the populations that we're worried about, from finfish to shellfish to eelgrass and those real basal habitat features that we're really looking for. Just as a snapshot for what's going on right now, our 2019 report, as you can see here, are showing that water quality in the harbor as it relates to nitrogen is improving or staying steady. New programs this, this year and last year, we were able to partner with the Great Harbor Yacht Club Foundation to do some base gallop surveys, channel whelk and knob whelk surveys, and eelgrass all at once. We brought in Stephen Heck from Stony Brook University and his research team to come up and show our department how to properly survey these animals and eelgrass, combine it with the data that was done through the Mariah Mitchell Association during the middle 2000s, and to really be able to get an annual population look at base gallops, both whelk species, and eelgrass. We do these surveys every September and they're happening right now. Integral to this is our shellfish propagation facility. It's kind of the crown jewel of our operation. We have the hatchery at Brant Point that we were able to do a massive renovation of the la in the last few years and have it running and are now producing hard shell clams, oysters, and Nantucket Bay scallops from this hatchery. We have different strategies, whether they be larval release, which you can see Tara doing in the picture, releasing base scallops to the harbor that we've raised in our hatchery, whether it's cohogs, which you can see just the pile of seed cohogs in these pictures as well, or oyster restoration and fueling that as we deploy those into the harbor. And then we use things like spat bags and other breeding strategies to properly monitor these and aid in our dive surveys to see what's going on. What we're hoping to accomplish with this is to be able to identify these areas of concern in advance and get seed relocated even before it hits the beach to lessen the burden on the community, but to also lessen the impact on the bay scallops. We're hopeful that as eelgrass is hopefully able to restore, that this enhanced seed management will also provide a much more resilient population of scallops and eelgrass in our harbors. Oyster reefs are gonna be really integral to coming back to be able to restore things like erosion control, wave attenuation, and other functions that provide a greater shoreline resiliency for our shellfish populations. It's our research that we're doing now that will hopefully lead to innovative solutions for looking at things like living shorelines and combining plants and benthic animals to help us restore and make our shorelines more resilient and able to withstand the pressures of climate change and sea level rise. Our other planning efforts 
also include the development of the Coastal Resiliency Plan, which is something that Vincent Murphy will speak to you in great detail later on. We don't do this alone. and We've had great support through the years from a lot of our collaborators and supporters. With all these partners together, we know we can develop strategies and implementation tools that will benefit all of us and help us make our island more resilient in the long term. If you're looking for more information, you can find anything that we do located on the town website. Or if you want to see what we're doing more in real time, we encourage you to check out our Facebook page, Instagram, and Twitter as we try to maintain a very active presence there for people to be able to see what's going on and to get feedback from the public. Without your feedback, our programs can't be as good as we want them and need them to be to develop all of these integrated strategies going forward to make sure that our island is here to stay and that the shellfish populations and healthy ecosystems continue to restore and we're all better going forward. I thank you for your time and look forward to any questions that you may have in the question and answer session at the end of the presentations. Thank you again to the Nantucket Land Council for hosting this forum and we look forward to participating in the future. Hello everyone, I'm RJ Turcott for the Nantucket Land Council. I serve as their resource ecologist and Nantucket waterkeeper. And today I'm going to be talking about climate change and our harbors, both Nantucket and Mattacate Harbor. So let's get started. So many communities in Massachusetts and elsewhere don't have any sort of policy goals or written language about climate change. And it's often not even really publicly available information, the issues that a lot of communities face. Luckily here on Nantucket, it's a very different story. We have no such luxury. We're surrounded by the Atlantic Ocean on all sides. So with that in mind, ourselves at the Land Council, many other nonprofits, and the town of Nantucket have been moving towards preparing Nantucket for climate change, for sea level rise, for rising water temperatures, and the other changes that climate change is bringing. And that's what I'm gonna discuss with you today. So perhaps the most obvious sign of climate change here on Nantucket to a casual observer is sea level rise. We as residents of Nantucket tend to see sea level rise everywhere. Now, there are a lot of factors that go into sea level rise. Now on the screen, I have what's simply a screen grab of Nantucket's GIS mapping. And all I did was go online quickly with my computer and I chose the storm tide pathways layer and those colored bands will show you at various storm tide levels how high the seas will get and which parts of the island will be inundated. This is really, really fascinating information and this was the kind of stuff that was really only available to government entities and now it's available to all of us, including you, including you homeowners, business owners, uh, the Land Council and other organizations, the town of Nantucket, are utilizing this sort of thing to help us prepare for sea level rise, and you should too. At least take a look at it in regards to your own properties. As our ability to predict and observe sea level rise improves, as the technology improves, we need to look at our policy goals as a community and integrate this information. Otherwise, we'll be in trouble as we try to build and work towards the future. So Nantucket is blessed with its own wetlands protection bylaw, and this is a more strict, specific to Nantucket bylaw on top of federal and state regulations. And this is something that a lot of communities don't have, but luckily we here on Nantucket have it, and it's very useful in protecting our resource areas, and it can be an important tool with regards to sea level rise and climate change in general. So we'll be working with the Conservation Commission with other interested parties to try to update and include sea level rise in the latest data possible in our wetlands bylaw going forward. Another major theme of climate change that's playing out in our harbors is a changing of our species composition. It's a changing of the plants and animals that make up our marine community. As water temperatures change and as conditions change we end up getting a lot of visitors that may or may not be here to stay. The Land Council has taken a particular interest in the European green crab. They're a voracious predator. They're a very, very good adaptive species. They've made themselves right at home on almost every continent 
obviously including our own, and they're quickly becoming the dominant crab species in New England. So we're looking at a variety of options, starting with trapping them in both harbors and trying to track where their populations are and where they're moving and how they're reproducing and moving on to what can we do about them. So they're a voracious species, they're clearly not going anywhere, so how can we help our own ecosystem deal with this destructive invasive? We've been looking into ways to cook them. We've been working with the folks who wrote the Green Crab Cookbook over at greencrab.org. And we've also been making fertilizer, organic fertilizer with the green crabs, which is another really good method for using up this, catching and using up this invasive species. Last but not least, rising water temperatures are stressing some of Nantucket Harbor's most critical species. The one the Land Council has taken special focus on is eelgrass. We've partnered with Dr. Alyssa Novak from Boston University to investigate the health of Nantucket's eelgrass populations and to see how temperatures are affecting them. And Dr. Novak has found that our eelgrass is in fact temperature stressed and climate change is only going to exacerbate this. So if eelgrass is temperature stressed, it has trouble reproducing and growing and expanding its range in our harbors. So this is something we have to really keep a close eye on. We install light and temperature ten sensors throughout the harbors. And this helps us to monitor how much light and exactly what temperatures these eelgrass meadows are experiencing. The completed health assessment will help us with policy decisions going forward, working with other organizations, the town, local business owners, to hopefully reestablish some of the eelgrass and help it as the climate changes. It's one of our keystone species. Not only does it provide habitat for many of our iconic species here on Nantucket, such as scallops, but it also serves as a very large carbon sink, pulling carbon from the water column, and it actually acts as a type of wave attenuator. So all of those blades of eelgrass and eelgrass meadows tend to dissipate wave energy during storms and can protect properties that lie behind them. So this is critical work we're working on and trying to improve Nantucket's eelgrass meadows for future generations. As we look to the future, and as climate change continues to be at the forefront of environmental issues here in Nantucket, the Land Council hopes to fund a comprehensive circulation study for Nantucket Harbor. And this circulation work can really tell us a lot about the nutrient loading in the harbor, temperature differences, inflows, outflows, and really help the Land Council and businesses and the town of Nantucket to better manage this natural resource for everyone going forward. On top of the circulation study, the Land Council also hopes that we can begin some sort of study on macroalgae in the harbor. Since Nantucket's such a popular cruising destination for so many boaters, and these boats come from all over the world, they often carry hitchhikers in the form of different species of algae that we would not normally find in our harbors. So we're hoping to start to document and keep a record of the algae species we have here because they do make up a pretty critical part of the marine community here. So if you'd like to get involved or if you just simply have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We'd love to have you aboard and we'd love to start a conversation with you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Jen Carberg with the Nantucket Conservation Foundation, and I'm going to talk a little bit about our research on salt marsh ecology and how that research helps us prepare the island for climate change, sea level rise, and preserving coastal resilience. Now, if you've heard me talk before, I talk a lot about salt marsh ecology and the importance of salt marshes for harbor health and ecosystem health around the island. If you see this map here, the blue is, our, is Nantucket Island, our island. The pink that's on it actually represents all of the area of salt marshes that we have within our harbor systems. And you can actually see that there's quite a bit of salt marsh within Nantucket Harbor and Pulpus Harbor and Madigat Harbor as well. And that these salt marshes help protect our upland areas as well as providing really important ecological benefit for our harbors. One of the issues with salt marshes that you may have heard is that they help remove uh, nutrients from entering our harbor system, which thinking about harbor health is extremely important. Salt marshes are really effective at pulling nitrogen and phosphorus 
out of water prior to it entering the harbor, which as we talk about harbor health, you know, is extremely important for our ecosystem and our scallop populations particularly. But as today we're really talking about coastal resilience, the other benefits of salt marshes um, for thinking about coastal resilience and helping our island respond to climate change and sea level rise is that salt marshes are really effective at buffering water, whether it's coming from increased tides, storm surges associated with increased storms happening within our harbor. And because salt marshes are actually able to take that water and hold on to it and then slowly filter it back out into the harbor system, they're also really good at protecting our coastlines from erosion. So having intact salt marshes is important for being that buffer between our upland and our harbor system and helping maintain overall resiliency of our shoreline to climate change and sea level rise. Now on Nantucket, we have approximately 1,600 acres of salt marsh, and the Conservation Foundation actually owns approximately 1,200 of those acres. So for us, a lot of our salt marsh research really focuses on not just conserving salt marshes, but also making sure that they're functioning well and doing what we can to restore salt marsh uh, function when we need to. So our research into looking at some of the issues on island, looking at the resiliency and the health of salt marshes, really ties into this idea of salt marsh dieback and potential erosion. So salt marsh dieback is one of the big issues facing our salt marshes on island, and we see a lot of this salt marsh dieback in Pulpus Harbor and some in Nantucket Harbor as well. Um, salt marsh dieback is kind of this suite of responses within a salt marsh that's really driven by the purple marsh crab. You can see the lovely purple marsh crab right here. It is a native crab species but when its predators are absent from a harbor system or decreased, the populations spike. And this purple marsh crab really loves to eat the native grass that you find um, within the salt marshes. And without that native grass, which the crabs are eating um, extremely well, the soils within the salt marsh can erode very quickly. There's nothing stabilizing or holding those soils in place anymore because the crabs eat all of the grass from the roots um, to the top of the grass itself. And you can imagine if that soil is sitting there without anything holding it in place, it's really susceptible to erosion, just through regular tidal cycles and then also when we get large storm events can come in and take away big chunks of the salt marsh. So this is a resiliency issue. And we've been looking at ways that we can kind of get ahead of that and stop this issue. So for the past two years at the foundation, we've been acting as human predators for the crabs, or we've actually been going in and trapping the crabs using very sophisticated um, empty tennis ball cans as traps that the crabs fall into, and then pulling them out of the system. And we talked a little bit about this last year at last year's State of the Harbor um, forum. We pulled out a lot of purple crabs last year. We also pulled out a lot of green crabs, which are an invasive crab that are detrimental to the scallop population. We caught them as bycatch and just removed them anyways. Um, we've continued doing this trapping this year. Uh, we found out two things last year being our first year. One is that it didn't actually take a lot of time for us to remove the crabs. That was one of our concerns was how effective it would be to remove crabs. And it doesn't take a lot of time to remove a lot of crabs. So we've con continued that trapping this year as well. What we found out last year also was that the grass was able to regrow. So when you look at the numbers of crabs that we trapped last year, we were still finding them this year. So we didn't negatively destroy the population. The population still exists. But we were able to remove enough of the population of crabs that the grass could start to regrow on its own. So the picture on the left-hand side of the screen here is actually taken last year towards the end of our field season, where we had grass growing in bare soil where we hadn't seen it in the past six years. So that was really exciting. We're giving the grass a chance to come back in and stabilize the salt marsh. This year we went out and we actually planted plugs or little plants of the same grass. You can see one next to the blue flag here in the picture. And we planted it out all across the salt marsh so that slowly that grass cannot just regrow from what already exists, but we're hoping that it can spread out from the plugs that we put in as well and continue to stabilize the soil within the salt marsh. And the very last piece of this project that we're just now working on is this idea of potentially introducing an oyster reef in front of the same salt marsh so that the oyster reef can help protect that marsh from erosion while we're dealing with issues of dieback and keep that marsh intact. 
We're doing pre-sampling this year to make sure we have the right habitat, and next year we're looking at putting out a very small salt marsh, or excuse me, a very small um, oyster reef just in front of the salt marsh in the intertidal zone there. And this oyster reef that we put in place will slow down waves that are impacting that shoreline so there's less of a chance of erosion happening off of that salt marsh. We're also gonna monitor it. This is fairly new research looking at oyster reefs where they're known to slow down wave impact, but haven't really documented that having one in place can help a salt marsh increase and grow and have increased resiliency. And all of these projects that I've talked about are actually fairly easy projects to increase salt marsh health and the resiliency of a shoreline, and they're projects that could potentially be used on individual properties around the island as well as throughout New England. And so then that makes them projects to that could be very applicable here on Nantucket to help us increase our resiliency around the island. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, my name is Vince Murphy. I'm the Coast Resilience Coordinator. I work in the Natural Resources Department for the town of Nantucket. Um, just when we're going to get started on this presentation, just have to show you in the title slide here, uh, this image here on the left uh, is the official emoji for sea level rise. So we're going to talk about coast resilience, but to understand coast resilience, we have to understand a couple of lead-in factors first. So climate change is an overarching problem that includes increasing atmospheric and water temperatures, ocean acidification, change in long-term weather patterns, and sea level rise. Sea level rise is the, the key part that we have to pay attention to here because that's the main factor look at the, uh, that we're being threatened with within the harbours. So NOAA has a definition of uh, resilience, and what we're talk talking about is how to bounce back uh, quickly from uh, impacts. So coast resilience means building the ability of a community to bounce back after hazardous events such as hurricanes, uh, coastal storms and flooding rather than simply reacting to them. There's a couple of problems with this. It's a nice definition but it doesn't account for some of the problems we have on Nantucket like erosion. It also doesn't take into account the historic status of the town and all the historic structures we have in the downtown area. So we have an improved definition uh, coastal res community resilience planning seeks to improve the capability of the community of, an, of a community exposed to extreme natural events to adapt to stress and change by resisting or changing in order to reach and maintain an acceptable level of function. It comes down to being acceptable. So we have to then think about the resilience cycle. Coast resilience isn't just do it once and done. It's about planning ahead of time, implementing those plans. Then you have a hazardous event, you then recover from the event, and then you move on again. You start monitoring and evaluating your adaption strategies, then you go through the whole process again, starting with a risk assessment. And the whole point is, it's all centered about uh, around improving resilience. Uh, it might work the first time, it might take to the third time, but every action is a step towards improved resilience. So we have some big problems here in Nantucket. Everyone knows we have these problems and we just have to define them. We know water is coming, we know flooding happens here all the time. We also know, and it is a bumper sticker, erosion happens. So. I like to think about things as we know those problems, but we have another one coming down the road. We have the new nemesis, sea level rise. So from this, we can see that there's been about 0 0.14 inches of sea level rise per year, roughly 1.4 inches per decade. That's about 8 inches of sea level rise uh, from 1965 to 2019. So bear that 8 inches in mind. So this is a projection moving forward for what Nantucket can expect from around about now up to the end of the century at 2100. That eight inches is represented by that little wavy line there. And the projections going forward, the intermediate and intermediate high data show we're going to get uh, in the range of about uh, four feet to six uh, and a half feet of sea level rise, roughly speaking, by the end of the century. These are the six different scenarios that NOAA uses uh, and we have to take these scenarios with a pinch of salt as we're trying to figure out the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and how that then has the knock-on consequence of impacting uh, ice caps. Okay, but what does this mean for the harbour? 
and particularly for access to the harbour. We have to understand how we can um, adapt and have strategies to adapt. So the basic structural adaption strategies are to accommodate the water, um, to protect or to resist. So when we start looking at adaption options, we have planning and structural resilience. Planning, you've got emergency preparations and how to respond. You can look at uh, redirection or retreat of development. And then there's a whole lot of procedural and regulatory and financial modifications that can be done. For structural, we can look at everything from seawalls, uh, floods and levees, groins, jetties, and then uh, even potentially temporary flood barriers. We can also look at flood proofing buildings, wet proofing, wet flood proofing, dry flood proofing, and also elevating buildings. But this comes down to scale. Scale is very important and it can be either site specific to each individual building, it might have to be increased to the neighbourhood level, or then a very large scale to the whole downtown area. This comes down to two key things, water management number one. But you also have to bear in mind you have to manage people's expectations. That is a tricky one to manage. Um, people want to avoid loss at all costs, but we're going to have to bear some level of loss. It's just at to what level that is acceptable. So just going to go through some methods very quickly. So these kind of fall into two um, uh, sorry, the hard infrastructure falls into two broad methods, uh, hard bank protection or hard sediment protection. So just to go with hard bank protection first, these are things that you might see around town or already be familiar with, but just for examples we have seawalls. We don't really have all that many seawalls on Nantucket, unsurprisingly, but we do have some revetments uh, at some uh, properties. There are also bulkheads, which we're familiar with, uh, from, say, Easy Street as, is a good example. But what we don't have here are levees, but this is just another type of hard uh, bank protection that is possible. When we talk about sediment protections, we end up talking about things like jetties, those big rocks uh, that keep uh, the wave heights down within uh, the entrance to the harbour. We can also talk about breakwaters, and this is one most people who get the ferry should recognise, it's the entrance to, Hi entrance to Hyannis. We do have groins here in Nantucket, uh, primarily in the North Shore in this example here from Hallowell Lane. Uh, there's also another method that is widely known, uh, geotubes. We also have adaptive methods. This is not something we've seen too much of yet on Nantucket, but this one example here I have is a breakwater from Norfolk in Virginia uh, that is used to reduce wave height and also allow sand to accrete behind it. Then one of my favourites, uh, I like to talk about uh, living shorelines and green infrastructure. It's how to use nature to help us uh, reduce wave and flooding impacts. These are things that have been discussed a little bit uh, before, but I kind of like talking about beach nourishment. Uh, adding to the width of the beach, this is a nice process, uh, it can really stop the wave run up and uh, it is done throughout Massachusetts but it's got a quite a difficult permitting process. We also have dune management, uh, there are some active projects like this and some more planned projects like this around um, the island, particularly in places like Madiket, where dunes are being planted with beach grass in order to have the beach grass roots uh, hold the sand in place. Also the beach grass uh, fronds as they stick out of the sand um, knock passing sand out of the air and help build sand up higher. We have plenty of wetlands here in Nantucket and we have to take care of our tidal, tidal wetlands in particular uh, and they are a wonderful filter and also uh, very good at holding water. Then we have hybrid techniques. This is an example of something that is going to take place out at Sackage Pond. We also have to think about community infrastructure protection, stormwater management and looking at avoiding in combination flooding. So inland stormwater retention, in green here you can see all of the ponds and wetlands within the town. These could easily hold water uh, before being released after a storm event down into the harbour. Uh, wait for the tide to go down, release the water. Green stormwater infrastructure. Um, I'm always going to be an advocate for native plants over anything else, but Phragmites is a good plant at holding and filtering water. Pump stations. This is a um, pump station from Children's Beach. It's an above ground one. Um, while they're waiting to put in a, 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 a fully um, operational underground one. This was taken early in the year, there is currently an underground one there at the moment, but that's um, going to get replaced as I understand it. 
gasketing pipes. So a lot of uh, stormwater pipes allow water to flow down into the harbour and what we need there is to put uh, infrastructure into the pipes uh, at some point so that if water does flow up the point pipe it cannot get to the streets. This is also done, uh, as you can see as an example, on Easy Street where we have these duck bill valves that stop water flowing in during high tide. At Children's Beach we also have a wave barrier. It's not necessarily to keep water out but what it's very good at doing is when this area of Children's Beach does flood it stops uh, high waves going straight up uh, the street. So all of these are aimed at uh, taking the energy out of waves whether it be hard infrastructure or green infrastructure. We need to consider ways that we can drain water better uh, and improving our stormwater system. We also Think, want to think about holding water before we re, uh, drain it later and we can also look at um, resisting water. This is something that we'd have to think a bit more about in Nantucket as this is one of the things that would have a significant visual impact as the left hand picture shows, this is an example from Holland, where they put these temporary barriers in place just before any flood event, then take them down afterwards. Is this something that we could think about for Nantucket potentially? Within the harbour we have to look what what sea level rise might do over time. It's not really going to affect scallops so much. Might need some longer ropes, but the scallops will be there. There are other problems uh, with climate change where uh, rising te water temperatures uh, and acidification might have an impact on them, but that's not what we're looking at here. We're just looking at sea level rise. Um, other shellfish and finfish, they're also not going to be uh, terribly badly affected by sea level rise over time. However, oyster farmers might be. The war areas that they work in are going to become deeper, so they're going to have to change some methods. They might also have to retreat uh, with uh, rising waters uh, to move to where the new low-lying areas for oyster farming are possible. There is a myriad of regulatory tools that can be used. Some of these are things that are going to get developed over time. Um, we can look at tidal marshes and pr uh, protection and advancement so that once they start migrating backwards to have an area for a marsh to migrate into. Other things to consider are the green infrastructure pro uh, projects for private property and how homeowners can do that for themselves, have more areas for water to flow into. Okay, but what does this mean for mooring fields, boat ramps and general access to the harbour? Mooring fields are unlikely to change, they're most likely just going to stay where they are. Piers will need to be adapted over time and they'll need to be raised and strengthened. Boat ramps uh, will also need to have their ac access adapted and access to the shoreline uh, is also part of the uh, colonial ordinance, so it's been part of our shared heritage for quite some time, and it's also enshrined in Chapter 91 now. So where are we going with all of this? We're now in the process of developing a coast resilience plan for the island. That will be a, so we're moving out of the development phase into the production phase. Uh, to get a coast resilience plan for the island. So this will take about a year. There's going to be quite a bit of public uh, consultation on this as uh, is already built into it. And then, roughly speaking, this, uh, September to October 2021, we're going to ha hopefully have something we can take to the select board uh, to be accepted as a new coast resilience plan for the island. So the ultimate goals of resilience is to reduce uh, the financial loss, have events cost less. What today might be a million dollar flooding event, can we reduce that down to being a $200,000 flooding event would be one hope. Uh, can we reduce the time frames of these impacts? And we need to bounce back and get back to regular business faster. And the main thing is one to do is to increase the longevity of the island. And as I already said at the start, resilience is a cycle and it is always planning to improve resilience. Um, Thank you for your time. A huge thank you to Jeff, RJ, Jennifer, and Vince for those great snapshots of some of the research and intensive planning efforts that are underway. So once again, I just want to let everyone know that there will be an opportunity to address questions to these presenters later on in the program. But right now, I am delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, 
for the evening. Elizabeth Rush is a 2018 Pulitzer Prize finalist for her latest book, Rising, Dispatches from the New American Shore. She received her MFA in nonfiction from Southern New Hampshire University and her BA from Reed College. Her work has appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Guardian, and she's received a large number of fellowships and grants. She currently lives in Rhode Island, where she teaches creative nonfiction at Brown University. I have personally been struck by Elizabeth's passion and engagement with this subject and her ability to really dive into the depths of such a challenging topic and to communicate that to such a broad audience through her writing. So it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Elizabeth. Hi everyone. Um, as Emily mentioned, my name is Elizabeth Rush and today I'll speak to you about my most recent book, Rising Dispatches from the New American Shore. First, I wanted to take a moment and to thank the Nantucket Land Council for hosting this event. Um, thank you, Emily, for emceeing and for that fabulous introduction and for all those amazing presentations that led up to this moment and all the really important work that they chronicle. Um, finally, I want to thank all of you for tuning in and for showing up to talk about the climate crisis. It's an honor to be here with you and to be part of your yearly State of the Harbor Forum. So if you could toss the first slide up. Thank you. Rising is an on the ground investigation of the impact that rising sea levels are having on different coastal communities around the country. Each of my book's nine chapters opens with a monologue delivered in the voice of one of the town's residents about an event that woke them up to their vulnerability and what they decided to do with that information. It's a book about climate change and in particular sea level rise, but it doesn't focus specifically on the science behind the phenomenon. Instead, it looks to those people living on climate change's front lines and asks what we might learn from them about the future that we share. So today I'm going to focus primarily on a small community on the eastern shore of Staten Island, a place that Sandy both undid and remade from the ground up. And by digging into the story of Oakwood Beach and the story behind that story, how it came to be in the book and the way that it is, I want to explore, I think, a really fundamental question. Whose voices have traditionally been left out of environmental discourse? And how is the climate crisis urging us to make this conversation more whole moving forward? Next slide, please. We tell ourselves stories in order to live, Joan Didion writes at the opening of the White Album her famous essay that tries and fails to make sense of how the idealism of the 1960s and California's golden dream gave, gave way to was consumed by a kind of unrelenting cynicism. Didion says that storytelling works as a sense-making practice, that is, until it doesn't, that there are moments and phenomena that really test and rend our ability to arrive at a narrative line. I've started to think that climate change is among them, and yet we keep trying to tell the story in a straightforward manner with conventional narrative techniques and news reporting. In 2011, I started to write about climate change, and in particular, sea level rise. But after about a year of covering this subject, I started to grow really bored with the language that I had to use to get climate change into the news at all. Each of the unique and unprecedented events that I was writing about, they all started to sound really weirdly familiar. Climate change, I started to realize, was entering into our contemporary culture as a never-ending set of record-breaking statistics, record-breaking storms, record-breaking heat waves, record-breaking rain, each successive extreme smashing the previous record-breaking record. And you can see that in the slide that was just up. All of those headlines just sound, they use the same language again and again and again. And when I started to write about climate change in this way, I feared that I was dulling readers to the dynamism at the heart of this transformation. These apocalyptic headlines also really overlooked specific ways in which climate change is impacting vulnerable communities and 
more importantly, bringing those communities closer together in new and unexpected ways. And I think you're starting to see that out on Nantucket. I started to suspect that climate change news when it sort of told the story in too straightforward of a manner, and then it confused us into thinking that the conclusion itself is foregone. I think by describing climate change in this manner, we steal some of its mystery, some of what Amitav Ghosh calls its un improbability or uncanniness. And I think in doing so, we also steal from ourselves the, the opportunity to be transformed um, and not just for the worse by this disruptive force. So throw the next slide up there, please. I was living in Brooklyn and teaching at the College of Staten Island when Hurricane Sandy hit. Over 400,000 New Yorkers were inundated, and you can see that in this image here. All the parts of all the parts in blue were areas that were underwater. 17% of the city's total landmass was flooded. Um, but you'll find out today in today's talk that those impacts were not necessarily evenly distributed. So I taught out at the College of Staten Island, which is sort of smack dab in the middle of the island. And you can see along, um, I'll be talking today primarily about a community that's in that area in blue on the right hand side of the island. In the weeks after the storm, the island entered a state of quiet crisis. The university closed, the ferry stopped running. I drove across the Verrazano Narrows Bridge one day to deliver a donation to the help center at New Dorp High School that had popped up. And all along Father Capadano Boulevard, boats lay in the middle of the street. They were smashed into single story ranch homes. And I knew that many of my students lived in that neighborhood. And when I saw those boats um, smashed into those homes, I knew that their lives had come undone in a way that I really didn't understand. Next slide. So when the university reopened, many of my students didn't actually return to my classroom. Generally speaking, CSI students work and attend school at the same time, and those whose homes were impacted by Sandy often moved into temporary FEMA housing or in with friends and family, sometimes as far away as New Jersey. And in the storm's wet wake, those students had a really difficult decision to make. Did they wanna drop out of school or stop working? Because they probably couldn't do both at the same time. And for many, as I think you'll understand, unfortunately, education took a back burner to their financial security. Next slide. And yet, when I read about this storm, in the newspaper, none of my students' stories appeared. And I think you could say that that was when I knew that for sure the way climate change was being covered um, was incomplete in some ways. I wondered where were my students' stories? Where were the stories of those who flooded before Sandy, who'd already blown through their retirement savings, getting back into their homes after Irene a year earlier? I began to spend a lot of time on the eastern shore of Staten Island interviewing residents about their Sandy experiences and their long and really frustrating recovery process. I didn't drive a car. I biked and then walked, going door to door and asking for people to share with me their storm stories. I found that if I was entering into these vulnerable communities, and asking residents to speak with me about a traumatic experience, I wanted to make myself vulnerable to. And that meant, you know, arriving in person, asking to be let into a stranger's living room, um, not driving a fancy car. And often it also meant, as I learned as I went along, it meant sharing personal stories about times in my life when someone or something that I loved deeply was also hurting me. I mean to say that part of what I started to do was leave my climate change discourse at the door and decided instead to just engage in a conversation and to listen. I spent whole afternoons in Oakwood Beach and Midland and Ocean Breeze where residents had begun to organize, to publicly ask that their homes be purchased and demolished and that the state aid in their relocation. 
And this, more than anything about Sandy and its aftermath, really surprised me. It was this clamor rising from the soggy side of the city's only Republican borough. The signs that read Mother Nature wants her land back and buyout wanted, buyout needed. I wondered what did residents of these right-leaning, often climate change denying, low-lying, working-class neighborhoods know that the rest of us did not? And how was it that they were interested in retreat, one of the most progressive and controversial adaptation strategies for sea level rise? We saw it mentioned briefly in some of the presentations leading up to mine today. And, and as you can tell, it's the main focus of, of mine. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Residents in these flood prone communities where I was working were interested in selling their homes to the state and they started what they called grassroots buyout committees where they went door to door educating their neighbors on what a buyout could mean and how it might serve them. And on this slide, you see some of the handmade maps that they use to keep track of their progress. Um, they color coded each individual property, red for those who weren't interested, green for those who were, and um, the sort of tan color for those who were on the fence. And especially in those properties where folks were on the fence, they would go to door to door and talk to them about how they could get pre-storm prices for their homes, how often the recovery time would be quicker compared to the city's Build It Back program. And it's the only adaptation strategy that um, really allows and enables residents to move away from risk permanently. They knew, and I think this is so important, they knew that this was information they had to carry into the community in a horizontal way. That only if it came um, not in a top-down method, but bubbled up amongst and between residents, this was how they'd get more people interested in thinking about um, moving away from risk and moving away from the place that had long defined them. Next slide, please. So I had been researching and writing about Oakwood Beach, Staten Island for a little bit over a year when one of the organizers of the buyout committee um, invited me to a party that she was holding to celebrate her brother, Leonard Montalto. Um, Leonard Montalto had died during the storm. And when I arrived, um, Patty Schneider, the organizer, introduced me to her niece, Nicole Leonard Montalto's daughter. And Nicole grabbed me by the arm and she said to me, um, you're writing a book, so you will help me memorialize my father and I'm going to tell you what happened um, during Hurricane Sandy. And then she took me into Patty's guest room and sat me down. And she spoke for almost two hours and I recorded the entire conversation and I just sat there and listened. And I'd like to today read briefly from Nicole's monologue from her testimony that opens her chapter where she describes that opens a chapter on Oakwood Beach and in it um, you'll figure out that she's describing the search for her father Leonard Montalto. And the reason I want to do this is because I think it's really important to bring Nicole's voice into the conversation. It was actually her voice that taught me how to write this book in the way that I did, taught me how important it was to have the voices of different residents be central to each of the different chapters. And so um, let's move to the next slide and I'll read to you briefly from her monologue. So this is Nicole's voice. I went into my house. I was screaming for my dad. Everything was upside down. The couches floated into different areas. My bed was up on the wall. The only things that didn't move were my dining room table and the filing cabinet because both were too heavy. That's where my dog took sanctuary on the filing cabinet. My cat was sitting on top of my bed. I didn't see my dad. I thought, Shit, maybe he left. Maybe he went to someone's house. But then I thought he wouldn't leave the animals. My dad's wallet was still in his room. There was something else, too, that he left behind. I don't remember what it was. 
the wallet. That was the biggest thing. It had his money and his ID. He wouldn't have left the house without those things. Oh, I know what it was. He was on and off smoking cigarettes. I'm the same way too. And he had left his pack on the table with a cup and a couple of butts, though he never smoked in the house. It's weird to timeline things. I mean, I spoke to him on the phone. He said it was really good. I got out when I did, that the water was rushing in. He was on the basement stairs when he was on the phone with me. Did he come back up and smoke two cigarettes? Was that before or after? I started to see those things that were cluing me into the idea that he never left the house. And when I started to see those things, I went down to the basement and began screaming. I was hoping that I would hear him, but at the same time, I wasn't. My dad's friends, once they knew he was missing, they broke all the windows in the basement to get the water out. They started pumping the water too. People say he was down there for the pump, but I don't see how it could have been the pump because the basement was already flooded. What the hell could a pump do? When we pulled up on Wednesday morning, my father's friend told us that they had found him. My father was in my sister's room in the basement. It's tough to see this neighborhood that I grew up in, that my father grew up in, that my sisters grew up in. I mean, we spent our entire lives there being demolished. But on the other side, it's nice knowing that this is to protect everyone else and that it can't happen again. At least it can't happen to the people I know and the people I love. And maybe the government really will do the right thing and let Oakwood go back to nature. After the storm, we were all like, we're moving to a hill. And we moved to a hill. By the time I was 26, I lived through two major floods, one of which took my father's life. Home was that house. It was my dad. It was my mom. It was my sisters. When my dad was gone, it wasn't home anymore. So move forward um, to the next slide. I think in order, you know, those words, when my dad was gone, it wasn't home anymore, stuck with me for a very, very, very long time. Um, Kieran Desai, the winner of the Man Booker Prize for her diasporic novel, The Inheritance of Loss, said, we talk so much about the vocabulary of belonging, but ours is an age of refugees. We need literature that's multiple in nature, that explores, for instance, the idea that an immigrant searching for home will actually undo our very notions of home. And Desai's words for me call to us and invite us to add new voices to the conversation, to produce literature that denies the idea that there's an official story or one clear linear narrative of any particular event. And I hear in her echoes of the awareness that Nicole Montalto was forced into when Sandy took her father's life. Nicole's story, I think, is one of profound dislocation of looking for her father and by extension her home where he ought to be. And discovering that not only is he not there, he is nowhere. And I think that this is a discovery that would untether her from Oakwood Beach and would play a really significant role in fueling Nicole and Patty and many of their neighbors to advocate for and eventually win the right to pull up their roots and relocate in. So next slide, please. In order to get a fuller picture of why residents would ask that their community be broken apart, I think it's really important for us to reach back in time. So in the image on the left, you see a detail of a USGS map from 1900. And anything that's this darker shade of light blue, um, that area was zoned as wetland back at the turn of the last century and as such was considered unfit for human use. The deeper I delved into New York City's past, the more the pre-urban landscape started to sh seem to shape our current day predicament, not just in terms of topography, but also in terms of demographics. So, um, 
I'll tell you, it's not always millionaires who put down spindly roots and swampland. So the second image uh, shows social vulnerability mapped atop flood risk. And it's from an application called Surging Seas. And you could put Nantucket into Surging Seas and look through layer flood risk on top of all different kinds of indicators, including social vulnerability. So one of the things that surprised me as I've been investigating sea level rise all around the country is that um, often, not always, but often, those that are at the highest risk um, are somewhere in the spectrum for low, medium to high. So those who are at the high risk to highest risk for flooding are also in some ways additionally vulnerable, vulnerable socially. Um, I think it's really important to note that the trauma experienced in this neighborhood during Sandy then didn't begin on the evening of October 30th, 2012, though that night would prove to be a particularly violent moment where social vulnerability was rendered visible. Um, there were 24 deaths on Staten Island. That's what you see all the way in the right hand of this slide. Um, more than half of the people to perish during Sandy in New York City were on Staten Island. And the majority of those deaths occurred on land that was previously zoned as wetland. These traumas certainly contributed to the idea that these neighborhoods once so beloved had perhaps ceased to offer the comfort that we think of as being synonymous with home. The storm itself, its devastating impact, um, is one of the reasons that residents of the Forgotten Borough became interested in managed retreat as a recovery strategy. The word retreat often implies, defe implies defeat in a military setting. But on the eastern shore of Staten Island, after the storm that took Leonard Montalto's life, retreat, I think, started to sound like relief. Relief from the flooding that had long defined these residents' lives. Next slide. For a long time, I really didn't know what to do with Nicole's story. I went home after that interview transcribed the entirety of our conversation word for word and then put that file in a folder on my desktop labeled Oakwood Beach interviews and there it sat for years. Um, I felt that no amount of essaying or writing on my part would add anything to what Nicole had said. Eventually I ran into the work of Svetlana Aleksevich and in particular her book Voices from Chernobyl which tells the story of the nuclear disaster and its aftermath entirely from the perspective of those who lived through the event. And when I read her work I began to understand just how powerful it is when someone speaks in the first person about an event that would reshape the trajectory of their lives. Many people have asked me about the process behind the creation of the testimonies or dispatches or monologues that ground rising. And that's really led me to reflect on what distinguishes my work from traditional journalism. And I think in many ways it has to do with where the writer's responsibilities lie. I think a traditional journalist is responsible to their readers, to informing public discourse. And with these testimonial style essays, I felt like my first obligation was always to the interviewee, to the speaker of the testimony. I wanted to make sure that I was getting their voice and their story correct. So once I had a transcription, I would cut out like 90, 95% of what had been said to create a narrative arc. And then I would send that to the interviewee and ask for their feedback. I wanted them to be collaborators in the creation of this book. I wanted them to sign off on their story, making its way into the world and in this way. And um, I should say that it was incredibly scary for me to send Nicole her testimony. I was afraid that she wouldn't want me to have it in the book or that she'd want it changed in really significant ways. Um, but I also felt like I didn't want to include it without her approval. To do that felt really, in a weird way, too akin to the kind of practices that define the extractive industry that lies at the heart of the climate crisis. I wanted these stories to be part of a healing process where residents 
started to gain agency over their stories and hopefully over some of their circumstances. And I think that that's really important because that's one of the things about climate change that I think scares us the most, this idea of losing control, that it demands that we cede control completely. Um, so as I edited the piece, I would edit it, send it to Nicole, she would edit it, send it back to me, and we went back and forth um, for a while until she felt like it really represented her storm experience, which is to say that I think of these testimonies not as an example of giving voice to those who've long existed on the margins of this conversation. These people have voices of their own. Instead, um, treating them as collaborators in this creative enterprise meant that I was handing off my microphone. I was giving them space to share their story. Next slide, please. So the more I worked on this project, the more I started to learn that resiliency can mean really different things in different places. And we've gotten a couple different definitions of resiliency today. Um, it's a word that you hear constantly in the climate change conversation. One thing I noted in the context of New York City is that in Manhattan, sea level rise resilience meant um, in terms of the, the plan that won the rebuild by design competition that's you know being funded uh, there it meant landscape berms with seagrass and habitat supports levees that double as skate parks and amphitheaters seawalls that support pop-up cafes and passive recreation meanwhile in staten island resiliency meant taking out a second mortgage on your storm wrecked home with mold creeping up the walls it meant scrubbing the mold off yourself as John Hijnacki did down at the VFW with many of his fellow members. And in this image you see there are two colors of brick. Um, all the lighter color bricks are brick that sat under the water line and then were cleaned by hand by him and the fellow members of the VFW. Um, resiliency meant waiting for months, sometimes years for the city's Build It Back program to lift your house. It meant getting shorted on your flood insurance claim money by FEMA in one of the largest scale examples of fraud in the federal agency's history. So in Staten Island, these, I think, unjust circumstances in the history of flooding led the neighborhood, brought, brought residents closer together to fight for what they felt was a fairer version of the storm recovery for them. So next slide, please. One thing that I've heard again and again um, as I've worked on sea level rise all around the country and listened to resident stories is that they often feel really alone with their plight. Um, certainly this was true 10 years ago. I think it's a little bit less true now, but in many places, some communities know of no other places that really share their circumstances. And in the absence of this information, people often choose to safeguard their homes themselves. So they build retaining walls out of brick and sandbags and stone, or they lift their home up on stilts. Um, as Harvey bore down on Houston, Kristen Massey attempted to wrap her ranch in heavy duty plastic sheeting. That's what you see in the image on the right hand side. Um, this is because the two previous years she shelled out over $130,000 to repair that home in the wake of back to back floods that swamped the city. But despite her best efforts, her home still filled with water, displacing her and her family for the third time in three years. And I think she would become aware of what many folks start to realize the deeper into the flooding story they get is that often individual flood fixes have their limits. So let's go to the next slide. During the same decade that I've watched the United States inundated again and again by record-breaking storms, another equally powerful phenomenon has also simultaneously started to unfold. All around the country, there are community-led flood survivor groups. Um, 
There's residents against flooding in Houston and low country flooded states of America in Charleston and a community voice in New Orleans. Many of these groups begin online and they often start in advance of a storm and serve as information sharing networks about where to get sandbags, the location of local shelters, the latest weather predictions. But once the floodwaters recede, the focus will often shift to the long and arduous process of recovery covering everything from how to file a flood claim to which contractors are least likely to rip you off. What I find even more heartening is that increasingly these individual flood groups are starting to join together. So this is an image that we should all be incredibly familiar with. <laughs> it's um, taken from the monthly Zoom meeting of Higher Ground, a nationwide coalition of flood survivors. It was started in 2017, and already their membership has ballooned to increase over 100,000 people all around the country. Every month, these community leaders get together and they discuss what they're learning as they've attempted to adapt to flooding in their communities. And in addition to connecting um, frontline communities with each other, Higher Ground also offers pro bono legal and scientific counsel. They filed lawsuits against unlawful wetlands development, the unjust use of flood pumps during storms. They've appealed development permits and house, uh, hosted educational forums to inform residents in their community about underlying infrastructure issues that exacerbate flooding. And I think in doing all of this, they're teaching me and each other that um, not only is it a little bit myopic to address flooding at an individual level, though it can be a first step, um, often the scale at which climate change is transforming our world demands that we reply in a collective way at the local, state, and federal level. And um, I just want to say also, and I think that this would be really interesting to speak about more thoroughly in the Q&A, I'm starting to see some communities be really proactive in terms of coming up with policies that can help residents think about managed retreat um, in advance of the storm to come. So for instance, um, in Norfolk, Virginia, they are trying to link upland development to manage retreat from those parcels at high risk of flooding. So the idea is simple enough. If you want to build outside of the floodplain in New Norfolk, you need to learn, earn resiliency credits. And one way to do that is to um, extinguish development rights in the low and wet part of town. This is something that Mary Carlson, the policy director at Wetlands Watch, told me over the phone when we spoke recently, she's been central to writing this new ordinance. So in other words, if you want to develop a mixed use commercial area in Alden Heights in Norfolk, you also have to help those flooding today relocate to higher ground. And this coming year, they're going to start a pilot project in partnership with a local land trust um, to really explore what shape the policy will take in practice. They're going to move four different flood prone parcels through the program in four different parts of town with four different perceived values in order to better calculate the overall cost of removing the homes from the floodplain and also the financial benefits the parcels may provide in terms of increased flood resilience in adjacent areas. Um, through something called the NFIP's community rating system, uh, removal and prevention of further wetlands development can lower the cost of insuring against flood risk in the region. And that's, uh, that's something that will be passed down to homeowners. And this is something that the planners in Norfolk are working on um, studying more closely in order to monetize the benefits of managing retreat in advance of the storms to come. Next slide, please. So back in Staten Island, eventually Governor Cuomo listened to the residents of Oakwood Beach, and over the course of a couple years, 600 homes were purchased and demolished along the Eastern Shore. Last summer, I had the opportunity to go back to Oakwood and visit with each of the three community leaders who were successful in securing a buyout. All lived within five miles of their original homes, up the hill and out of the floodplain. 
They all still lived on Staten Island. We ate lunch together at their same old favorite seafood restaurant. Um, and they told me that thanks to the 5% bonus on closing that the state offered, 80% of residents remained on the island, which is to say that the buyout didn't shatter the community and it didn't lead to the hemorrhaging of property taxes, two of the things that are most often feared. Um, residents, the majority of residents went to the same butchers and grocers. They still hung out together on the weekends. They would go down to Oakwood to fish. Their community remained largely intact. What had changed was their immediate vulnerability to flooding. And when I asked them what they thought of the new flood wall that was being built along the eastern shore of the island, their response really surprised me. Um, one leader told me that's only a temporary fix. The seas are rising and it'll give folks a false sense of comfort. So remember, this is someone who three, four years prior was like very evasive with me in terms of even calling out climate change as a driver for flooding in this community. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about what moved him and many of the residents of Oakwood from climate change denial to acceptance. And I don't think it was the flooding that actually generated that change. Many, um, the flooding had been there long before uh, the change occurred. I think one of the things that generated that change was that residents got to choose how they wanted to adapt. And they also started to see that climate change wouldn't necessarily mean the end of the things they treasure most in their community. Um, that's, when, that's when Frank could call out climate change as one of the most significant drivers that instigated him and his move. Next slide, please. So I think we need to only look to Oakwood Beach for evidence of the electric possibility that climate change can awaken in us. I think when communities that have long been made vulnerable by existing structural inequalities are also directly impacted by climate change, it can awaken not only an awareness of vulnerability, but an awareness that vulnerability is shared at a local um, and increasingly state and national level. I think this realization brought residents of Oakwood Beach together demanding access to one of the most progressive sea level rise adaptation techniques we have. And at an even more basic level, I think it just inspired them to raise their voices and try to start to regain control over their community's destiny. So thinking back to that Joan Didion line, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. My work on rising regularly reminded me that the right to speak about one's shifting relationship to the environment and to have that story heard is something that ought to be extended equally to everyone, regardless of the specific language they choose to use, um, but all too often is not. Next slide, please. It sounds deceptively simple, and, some and it is in part, but I also think when a conversation has long been dominated by a select few, I think listening can be a really surprisingly potent act, upending historic power imbalances. As the tides get higher and storms stronger, those long exposed to flooding who've lived in areas where property taxes cannot, will not cover the cost of innovative infrastructure solutions. These people have precious knowledge that the rest of us do not. And I would say also, I would extend that to these wetland species have precious knowledge that the rest of us do not. As the words that they alight upon, um, excavate, share, become part of the language we use to describe these uncanny and improbable days. I think that is how climate change can, will, is becoming more than just a catalyst for cataclysm. As this conversation loosens, becomes more democratic, I think our ability to seize the moment as an opportunity for coalition building, especially amongst those long made vulnerable, is growing. So perhaps together we can make that ever more popular protest chant come true. The seas are rising, and so are we. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for sharing some of your experiences and stories from your research, which in many ways speak more directly to how these issues actually impact the physical homes and the lives and the sense of place of our coastal environments. I think it's really essential that as a community, we continue to merge and connect the implications that sea level rise has both ecologically as well as culturally and socially. So that's um, a really, really great talk to hear. So I'd like to transition now to some questions and answers. Um, if you do have a question, you can type it into the Q&A box that you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Feel free to specify who the question is directed towards if you'd like to direct it to anyone in particular. And I also just want to let everyone know that if you have not read Elizabeth's book, Rising, or you would like to get a copy of it for someone else, we do have them available to purchase through the Land Council. You can contact the office or email tag at nantucketlandcouncil.org directly in order to get a copy. And I know they're also available at Nantucket Bookworks. Following the Q&A session, I also just want to encourage everyone to stick around for our break, but there's exciting new program that's being launched by Remain that will also help our community explore how we can possibly adapt our downtown area to rising seas. So I would like to just start with um, a question that I would open up to any of the presenters, and that is about the change that Nantucket's going to face. Nantucket is going to change the way our shorelines look and how we interact with them is going to be different. What is the best way, or one of the best ways, to prepare the community for this? And what are the most important educational components for this ongoing conversation? So I'd love to uh, ask one of our panelists to maybe address that, how to really best engage uh, broad cross-section of the community in this conversation um, and help prepare them for what's to come. Elizabeth, I don't know if you want to share anything experience. Absolutely. I was reticent to speak first because I believe, you know, all of you know your community better than I know your community. Um, that that being said, one thing that I've seen um, start to unfold in particular in Louisiana through something called the LF LA Safe Program is um, sort of a three-step process. The state has come up with a bunch of visualizations that show um, the parts of Louisiana that are most flood prone. Um, color coding them in three different basic colors and highlighting areas that are likely by 2100 to be areas that we have to retreat from areas that are it's a little bit less clear whether or not that's something that will likely come to pass based on the rate at which sea levels rise and areas that are um, less vulnerable to flooding They've rolled out these maps in a bunch of different communities across the state and in eight different communities they started to run um, community-led discussion groups around the maps. And I think really importantly, they said to the eight different pilot communities, we have funding for you for two different projects. You can choose based on what you see in the information here, um, which kinds of adaptation strategies you want to pursue. And one of the things they've found and that they've been a little bit surprised by is that for instance, and I think this is really important, there will be a community that will, you know, with one bucket of funding, um, purchase and demolish homes in a particular neighborhood and with the other bucket of funding, put in a living seawall. So the community isn't choosing, you know, retreat or, uh, innovative infrastructure, they're getting to cycle through a process of thinking about what makes us who we are and how do we want to prioritize different aspects of the community. So that community that I'm talking about 
you know, they decided to put a, like a living seawall in front of the marina. They wanted to maintain that part of their community for as long as they can. And then there was another pocket of flood prone properties that had flooded again and again and again that residents wanted to retreat from. And they said, okay, we'd like to purchase those homes. And I think um, that model is really interesting in that it relies on expertise to make visible some of the different risks that are coming down the pike, but then it also empowers local residents to make some decisions around what to do with that information. And I think, you know, um, it makes me think of something that my birth coach said to me. She was like, one, one, you know, two women can have the same exact birth process, but those women who get to make a series of small decisions along the way will experience it as transformative. And those who feel like everything is being done to them will experience it as a trauma. And I think that that very much holds true with climate change adaptation as well. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Jen, would you like to speak to that as well? I certainly would. Thank you, Emily. Um, what Elizabeth has spoken about, I think, has really highlighted what we on Nantucket are starting to think about as far as how we interact with our community on our responses to climate change. And if you've listened in or attended any of our Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee meetings, you know that the town is really moving towards developing a coastal resilience plan for the entire island. And that's one of the things that we talk about a lot and we have an education subcommittee and the idea is how do we get out and connect with all of the different communities on Nantucket and begin bringing not just a plan that we develop and show to people, but getting the communities invested in that plan and having a voice in that plan. And, and I think we all kind of recognize that the way that Nantucket is gonna be successful on responding to climate change on island as an entire island is by bringing all of the communities in. And, and I really like the examples Elizabeth um, just talked about. And I know that we definitely have plans for trying to bring the conversation to all the different levels on Nantucket as, as best we can. Great, thanks for that, Jen. Um, I do have um, one more technical question, and that is asking about whether or not the songs that you spoke of in your presentation are also used in Madiket Harbor, or if they're just used strictly in Nantucket Harbor. The length and size of the opening uh, is, as Jeff pointed out, is the starting question. Then the second is, uh, what would that do? Uh, Jeff was already talking about how it could uh, start alter water quality and improve water quality at the head of the harbour. Then we have to look at potential for uh, flushing. When you'd end up having two entrances effectively, uh, it could have some short-term impacts whereby water comes in one side and then would not get stuck in the harbour during a high tide event, during tidal stacking and then you wouldn't have so many issues. But that's only an assumption, that's something that's not been mounted. We also have to look at waves coming from the breach area coming into the harbour, and given the angle of the harbour and uh, the shallowness, it's unlikely that significant waves would end up reaching the downtown area, but there might be some, potentially some increased um, wave action at, in the head of the harbour. But again, that is something that would have to be modelled and we don't well understand. Great, thanks Ben. Uh, Vince. Uh, Jen, if you want to add something to that before we move on. I can certainly try. Um, the, the one aspect of this that I think would be important to mention is that and, and we don't necessarily have the modeling data to look at this yet. This is something I think we need to explore. But if the hallover opens and potentially stays open for a long period of time, then there pulls into question the resiliency of Coscata Co2, which acts as a barrier to the harbor itself. It creates the harbor itself and also provides a really important barrier in storm events to that northern harbor shore of the island. So there is the potential then to kind of decrease the resiliency of the inner part of the harbor of those shorelines that now get protection from CO2 would then potentially be um, exposed to 
some more wave action um, and more storm events. So there definitely is a balance of potentially a flushing of nutrients, but also then potentially a loss of the stability of our, our harbor system itself. Great, thank you, Jen. So before we conclude, I have invited Cecil Jensen, Executive Director of Remain Nantucket to share their exciting new program that myself and several of tonight's speakers will be participating in over the coming year. So I wanna just take a few minutes now to allow Cecil to introduce and announce that new program. Good afternoon, I'm Cecil Baron Jensen, the Executive Director of Remain Nantucket and Remain Ventures. Nantucket Island is among hundreds of US cities and towns threatened by sea level rise. By the year 2100, much of Nantucket's historic downtown is projected to be inundated with water. That's a dire warning. But like so much about climate change, it's hard to see or imagine the impact. So we run the risk of either being, in equal measures, terrified or blasé. Thankfully, last year's Keeping History Above Water Conference, hosted by the Nantucket Preservation Trust and Preservation Institute Nantucket, gave us the visuals. The images presented by Marty Hilton and his students showed our beloved downtown with up to eight feet of water. The images became a call for action. Capitalizing on Nantucket's long history of economic ingenuity and environmental resilience, and inspired by the town and others who are working toward positive responses to sea level rise, Remain Nantucket is introducing the Envision Resilience Nantucket Challenge. Envision Resilience calls on multidisciplinary teams of graduate students, architects, designers, artists, engineers, naturalists, and conservationists to reimagine Nantucket Harbor and propose innovative and adaptive ideas to address current and future impacts of coastal sea level rise. The teams will be collaborating and competing in a structured design studio scheduled for the 2021 winter term. Proposals will be evaluated by a jury of professionals during a summer exhibition. In addition, the island community will be invited to participate in a series of cultural and community events. By working with academia, collaborating with a core group of Nantucket advisors, and listening to and drawing inspiration from narratives of local residents, the challenge is expected to deliver fresh thinking about adaptation strategies in the face of sea level rise. Hopefully, moving forward, we as a community will be motivated to be responsive rather than reactive, to feel inspired rather than distressed by predictions of rising seas. Thank you. There's a global crisis emerging right now, one that's been going on for almost 100 years. It's the reshaping of the world due to the forces of climate change. In coastal communities, island communities like Nantucket, you see the impact of climate change in sea level rise. And we're already seeing it now. We see it every time there's a big storm, every time there's a super high tide. How are we going to adapt to this? We're vulnerable. How are we going to live in a world where our coastlines will change? And our economy, our society, our environmental connections will all shift. At Remain Nantucket, we thought it would be really interesting to bring together some thinking partners to help us envision a positive direction for the future. What does adaptation here look like? We invited people who work in design and architecture and engineering, art and conservation, and then connected those folks with people from a variety of academic institutions around the country who are also thinking about the same issues. By the spring of 2021, we'll have interdisciplinary teams of graduate students researching, analyzing, and developing proposals for an adaptive Nantucket waterfront. We don't really have a choice. We have to take the challenge.
Okay, well, thank you so much once again to our sponsors, the Nantucket Shellfish Association and Anderson Stillwater Moorings, along with the Nantucket Land Council Water Fund Founders Circle. A huge thank you to Jeff, RJ, Jennifer, Vince, and especially Elizabeth for joining us tonight. I also just want to give a great big shout out to NCTV who have really been an incredible resource and done a great job supporting our transition from an in-person to an online event season. We really look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you soon. Good night.